Okay, so we are sharp at 7.30 p.m. So we will be starting the broadcast now. So hello and welcome to the session of ACS Science Talks, Connecting the World Through Science. This is the virtual lecture series, scientific talks by specialists on specialized topics for a specialized audience. I'm Kunal Gupta, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's broadcast of ACS Science Talks. Some brief announcements. Uh, this session will be recorded live and would be placed in the ACS Science Talks library. In case you face any technical difficulty, you can reach out to our team members in the chat box. ACS Science Talks are an interactive program, and we would love to get you involved in the discussion. You can share your thoughts and questions in the Q&A panel. The moderator will take up these questions with the expert during the Q&A session. You can use the chat to introduce yourselves and say hi to our expert. Now, before we begin the session, a brief message from the American Chemical Society. At ACS, our efforts are guided by our vision and mission, which also determine our goals. We have set out for ourselves five goals to provide information solutions that address global challenges and other issues facing the world scientific community, to empower our members by providing access to opportunities, resources, skills, training, and network, to support excellence in education by fostering the development of innovative, relevant, and effective chemistry and chemistry-related education, to communicate chemistry's value to the public and to policymakers, and to embrace and advance inclusion in chemistry by promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and respect, and creating a welcoming and supportive environment. In its effort, ACS provides a variety of resources. One of our flagship ACS resources is the ACS meetings. Just like ACS Science Talks is a platform by ACS to connect researchers, ACS meetings aim at unifying the scientific community. Every year, active researchers and professionals from across the globe come together to share ideas and advance the scientific and technical knowledge. ACS meetings are regularly attended by thousands of science professionals every year. And as we mentioned about the goals and mission of ACS to support the global scientific enterprise, ACS has taken the challenge of COVID-19 pandemic and converted it to an opportunity. ACS meetings have embraced the hybrid model, which is helping us to enhance the networking opportunities by combining in-person interactions with virtual networking platforms, promoting inclusion and accessibility by removing geographical barriers, enhanced representation by reaching out to a diverse range of presenters and attendees, providing flexibility and convenience by accommodating different preferences and circumstances, increasing engagement and interaction to foster a dynamic and inclusive conference environment, provide continued knowledge sharing opportunities during unforeseen circumstances, and promote sustainability and cost effectiveness by eliminating or reducing the need for travel and accommodation expenses and associated carbon footprint. To further the hybrid model and increase its effectiveness for our global audience, we are glad to introduce the Global Virtual Symposium. This will be a fully virtual programming during ACS meetings developed in collaboration with our global partners and will cover multiple symposia dedicated to chemistry and allied fields and most importantly, the virtual sessions will be catering to daytime of different global regions, Asia, Pacific, Africa, Middle East, Australia, Latin America. So uh, keep on the lookout for the Global Virtual Symposium programming in Asia Spring 2024. One of the symposiums scheduled for Spring 2024 will be Dynamic Molecular Crystals, Mechanistic Insights and Applications as Smart Materials. This symposium will be chaired by Professor Panche Naomo and Professor Sajesh Thomas. So be on the lookout for the programming for this symposium at ACS Spring 2024. And it just so happens, both the chairs are featured today in our today's broadcast of ACS Science Talks. Our moderator for today is Professor Sajesh Thomas. Professor Thomas is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at IIT Delhi, where he explores the physical chemistry of molecular solids, bridging two areas, quantum crystallography and crystal engineering. Prior to joining IIT Delhi, Professor Thomas completed his PhD from ISC Bangalore and did his postdoctoral stints at University of Western Australia and Aarhus University, Denmark. Thank you for joining us, Professor Thomas. Now, our speaker for today is Professor Panche Naomo. Professor Panche holds a PhD in chemistry and material science from the Tokyo Institute of Technology and is a full professor of chemistry with tenure at New York University, Abu Dhabi where he leads the Smart Materials Lab. 
which is the leading research team in chemistry and material science in the UAE with an output, according to Nature Index, that accounts for about 40 to 60% of both the number and fractional count of high impact publications in chemistry in the country each year. His research portfolio includes over 270 publications and his research group has raised over $15 million of extramural funds in addition to sizable startup and other internal funding received for the past two decades. For his accomplishments, he has received several awards, including Human Frontier Science Award 2011, the Asian and Oceanian uh, Photochemistry Association Prize in 2014, the Frederick Wilhelm Bessel Research Award from the Alexander Von Humboldt Foundation in 2015, the Radcliffe Fellowship at Harvard University in 2018, the Hans Marillis Zimmer International Scholar Program uh, in 2020, and a special visa by the UAE government for outstanding contributions to the country. Additionally, Professor Naomo was the founding chair, current secretary and treasurer of the UAE chapter of American Chemical Society. He's also a founding president of the Emirates Crystallographic Society and a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and the American Chemical Society. Thank you, Professor Naomo, for joining us and the stage is all yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gupta, for this wonderful presentation, um, for uh, the introduction that I couldn't have done better myself, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> it's an honor to be here, <clears throat> and I hope you can see my presentation. I'm thrilled to be part of this, uh, uh, this meeting and to be able to present our results. I'm really happy to see how the region is coming together, and I'm also very uh, excited about the turnout for this uh, this uh, this presentation and uh, the number of countries, the number of, of attendees. It's really really impressive. And a little bit of advertisement here: um, our chapter in the UA will be uh, uh, hosting the ACS MENA Regional Conference uh, in February next year, and you are all invited to come and take part in this uh, uh, very, very uh, inclusive event that will host the 13 original uh, ACS chapters. Uh, we will have also a student symposium attached to it, and it is definitely be a forum for connecting and for uh, showing your uh, science, but also networking with, with others from, from the region. So uh, let me go on to my presentation. Um, as uh, Dr. Gupta mentioned, I already uh, I'm I'm coming from Abu Dhabi, uh, from New York University, which has an outpost in Abu Dhabi. I have a cross appointment with our main campus in NYU, and I'm also a director of the Center for Smart Engineering Materials that we established last year. So I wear many hats, uh, but today I'm not going to talk about all of my uh, commitments. I'm going to show you only our part of our scientific doing my lab in Abu Dhabi and introduce you perhaps to uh, one of the most exciting recent developments in material science, which is that related to smart uh, crystals or smart organic crystalline materials. So my presentation contains two parts. The first one will be general introduction about smart materials and material science in general for the audience who are not familiar with the subject. And then in the second half, I would like to be uh, to, to go more technical and tell you more about the details of our own research, and I hope that you will be able to follow that part uh, as well. So uh, let's go back to the basics and how the materials shape the society. Um, what you can see here is a timeline of uh, different uh, uh, industrial revolutions. So there there were, as you know, three industrial revolutions in the past. And I must uh, point out here that all of these were guided by the development of materials. It is very likely that the fourth industrial revolution and we are the cusp of that revolution now, which is uh, perhaps mostly um, uh, related to the robotics, artificial intelligence, internet of things, 3D printing, all of these things are, will be guided by the development of new materials. So materials will continue to play an essential part of the human life. And then uh, when, we, when it comes to science, we can also see that these, these developments reflect in how the science evolved over time. So science evolved or diverged from philosophy in physics, chemistry, and biology. And then in the 60s and 70s of the past century, there was this cross disciplinary talk where um, biochemistry and biophysics developed and, and so forth. And there was a further conversion uh, or uh, converging into material science and, and other disciplines 
And what this is um, uh, go, go to in the future is definitely in some sort of integrating science and technology. And this poses a new challenges for us as scientists to be able uh, to be open uh, and, and receptive to others um, and uh, other disciplines, their methodologies, the language they speak and so forth. Uh, so a very brief uh, uh, history of science. Uh, on the left side, you will see by date how uh, materials uh, have developed, the material science. And here on the, on the right side, you will see a kind of a qualitative or semi-qualitative plot, which is taken from one of the Ashby books that shows on x-axis the date and of time. And on the y-axis, we have the relative importance. Again, a very qualitative representation of how different materials have become relevant over the time. So it started with uh, natural materials like polymers and wood and so forth. These are natural polymers. And then we have the age of steel, you know, first the bronze and iron, the age, the age of steel. Then we have the polymers, we have the age of silicon, obviously, uh, and uh, last uh, century. And as we progress in the 21st century, we will uh, probably move to other materials. And these are so-called architectural materials, like metamaterials. But a very important part of this development are, is probably going to be related to bio-inspired materials and particular bio-inspired composite. So we are uh, going to um, materials which are more and more being inspired by nature. And as I hope that I will show you by the end of my presentation, this particular material class that we work on and those that are organic crystals can behave as some biomimetic materials. A huge uh, part of our uh, uh, future will be played by robots. And we can already see these developments, you know, so we have different types of robots, which are look sometimes like this, but also we have small robots like this, or the, even smaller than a coin. And so the robots will start or continue to evolve. But one of the important direction of this development is that probably the robots will start to look like us. So we are going to make robots that are more human-like, more animal-like. And these are the so-called soft robots, which are based on soft materials. So the question here from the material science perspective is how can we find new materials for these developments to respond to these challenges? Um, and so the properties are usually referred to different parameters, one of them being the Young's modulus. So the classical robotics is based on hard materials like metal or metal alloys, but it is very likely that the uh, future soft robotics will be based on softer materials, such as the, uh, the ones that most of the tissues in the natural organisms are made. So we are trying to explore that um, borderline between soft and hard materials by promoting a new class of materials, which are uh, organic crystals. Now, let's go to the basics. When we think about uh, the properties of materials, they are inevitably related to the structure. And so the question, are, question is, which are the basic or essential properties for every material for us to optimize and make them better for particular applications? And there are essentially three. So we have the physical properties, the chemical properties, and mechanical properties. And these mechanical properties are sometimes considered part of the physical properties. But in principle, they are so different that we can actually think of them as a separate class. It's interesting that uh, we as chemists, I'm chemist by training, we have put a lot of effort in the past in, in explaining the physical and chemical uh, properties, but we are not very familiar with the mechanical properties, which we have somehow at some point delegated to the engineers. And that can be from two reasons. The first reason is that we don't necessarily understand the methods for characterization of the mechanical properties. And the second is we don't know how to engineer them. Um, and then on the other hand, the engineers are not very familiar with the structure and how we can play with the structure from a chemical perspective. How can we vary the structure in order to uh, design particular mechanical properties? So at some point of time, we realize that there is a serious knowledge gap between the two communities, which tend to speak different languages. And we would like to bridge that gap by bringing the mechanical properties closer to the chemical intuition, start to understand what kind of methods can we use to study them and try to uh, perhaps even predict uh, or uh, uh, design these properties based on our understanding of the chemical structure. And this is our research, what, what, this is, uh, what, research, what our research is about is about understanding these mechanical properties in order, in order to be uh, uh, able to capitalize on the structure of different materials. Now, a very, very basic question uh, for the audience, and you, can, uh, you, you won't be able to answer, unfortunately, because it's an online meeting, but you can think about it. 
if you had a material with this, like this, and you try to bend it, uh, what kind of uh, response you would expect? Obviously, it will, it will bend because it's a plastic. And if you have a material like this, you'd probably expect it to break because it's a glass and glass is brittle. If you have a material like this, you will expect it to bend multiple times because it's a metal, it's a wire. But what happens if you have a material like this, organic crystals? Is it going to bend? Is it going to break? You know, I probably you will think it's going to break, but not, not always. This is an example uh, of uh, organic crystals where my uh, very, very hardworking uh, student, Marielle Kadavi, is trying to bend. And as you can see in this particular material, it does bend and it is flexible, similar to plastic. So it can be bent, it can be shaped into different shapes. You know, you can write letters with, with it, you can, you know, make, make cylinders and whatever. And this is not expected for organic crystal. So what we are looking here is a very special mechanical property that obviously has it in the structure. So how can a crystalline matter, which has a long range order like this, behave similar to soft disordered uh, amorphous matter? And these are only some of the questions that we have encountered and we would like to be able to answer by uh, in-depth study from um, various perspectives, including the structure, um, uh, for uh, um, assessment of the properties and so forth. There's another side of the story here, and that is that many of these last of molecular crystals actually show dynamic properties. So they can be flexible, they can be shaped and morphed into different shapes, they can roll over, they can move, they can creep, roll, walk, and so forth. And all of these is not typical for uh, um, uh, inanimate matter, such as crystals. These are properties that you would expect to find in biological systems. And so we are interested in this dynamic aspect of the, of the, of the crystals. Uh, the advantages of the crystals are many. Uh, so they are lightweight by definition because they are composed of light atoms. So that translates into low density. They are ordered on a long range uh, structure. They are anisotropic, they are light, they are soft and so forth. So in many ways, they are different from polymers, but we are looking at a new class of materials which combines a long range structural order and softness, which, which is unprecedented for these kind of materials. Now, a long time ago, we decided to work with crystals and not with powders, because as you can see from this table here, the crystals are lightweight, but they have long range order and anisotropy. I'll tell you more about this. But also because crystals, in principle, at the beginning when they are formed, they are devoid of defects. And there are so many things that are detrimental for the performance and, and actually take part on the defects. Now, the question that we would like to, uh, to address here is how can we control these properties? How can we optimize the, their performance? Uh, what are the limits of performance up and down? And what is the dynamics? Because all of them are uh, actually dynamic properties. So what can we do with crystals practically in future, you know, in some, some visionary, um, uh, endeavor that, that we, uh, we think about in the future is that we can in fact replace all the electronics, which is now based on films or powders with single crystals. And you can think about actuators, detectors, sensors, switches, uh, emissive materials, and so forth. In all cases, because we have a problem, a problem with the mechanical compliance, currently we use films. Imagine we change all of this with single crystals. We're talking about a new science here, a new direction, not only structural uh, material science, but also in electronics uh, uh, and optoelectronics. So um, we try to summarize the evolution of the dynamic crystals. And this very busy plot that I'm going to show you shows the main contributors in this field. And you can find the details in this uh, chem -SOC ref paper that just appeared uh, this year for 72 pages. So it basically kind of summarizes the state of the art. Uh, this field started back in the 60s or 70s of the previous uh, century, where people were looking at phase transitions, studied very carefully the phase transitions. And then at the beginning of this century, uh, they started to observe some phenomena which are not typical for crystals, such as jumping, you know, moving, flexibility, and so forth. And then uh, in the last 10 years, there has been an explosion of papers and groups that are joining this research field, trying to explore these properties. So you can see what we're looking here is definitely a development of a new direction, research direction in material science, uh, and we would like, we are very excited to see where it takes us next. 
The uh, compounds that are involved are very diverse in chemical nature. Again, sorry for the busy slide. We have crystals that can change by light, uh, by heat, you know, they can move around. We have so-called super last and heresy crystals, and also uh, we have other like fast and slow phenomena. So you can see that, and these are not all of them, obviously, this is just a selection. You can see that we're looking at a very, very diverse chemistry very uh, a rich uh, a rich uh, uh, palette or palette of uh, of intermolecular interactions. You can study this at the molecular, intermolecular, supramolecular level, you know, and all kinds of uh, all kind of different approaches we can take to understand. You can see a small molecule, very big molecule, complex, very simple, and so forth. So at some time we decided to kind of give it a name to this new direction, and we thought crystal electronics was a good uh, choice. We actually borrowed, I have to admit, this uh, adaptronics uh, word from engineering, because in engineering, when you have adaptronic system, you typically have a sensor unit, you have a control unit, and you have actuating unit. And these are three separate systems. In smart material or smart structure, all of these are integrated into the same, same uh, device. So we want to think of crystals as a smart material, a smart structure, because the crystal can sense the light or heat and so forth. The molecules do their job. So we do that. So we have three functionalities integrated in the same homogeneous uniform material. And so this is where the smart aspect of the of the crystals comes into the picture. And I hope that others will be receptive of this term because it's a less colloquial than using dynamic or jumping or crystals or or, or so forth. So I think I think it's 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 appropriate term. Now, how do we go around putting the crystals on the global material space? Well, this is a very, very busy plot, and it's practically an HP plot, so-called HP plot, which correlates to uh, different quantities. On the x-axis, we have a density, and here we have Young's nodules. And here are the all materials known to mankind in different uh, colors. And so this red blob that you see here are the organic crystals. So our purpose with our work is to put the crystals on the global materials map and advertise them as a new type of engineering materials, which have special because they combine ordered structure and the softness, which is typical for disordered materials like polymers. Um, and so we have uh, gone and made a search over the past 30 years. Uh, this is as far as we could go to find the mechanical properties of the crystals and uh, analyze them and put them on this global map. And we uh, determined the limits between them highest and the all lower limits of these um, of these mechanical properties. And here you can see a zoomed representation of all the crystals characterized out there. So as you can see, uh, they have uh, a narrow densities, uh, a range of densities. They have uh, a pretty much consistent Young's moduli, but they are very, very stiff, unusually stiff crystals that we are especially interested in because these are the upper limits of how intermolecular interactions can contribute to the stiffness. And this is very important because there must be something special about these materials. And I don't have the time to go into details, but I'll be happy to discuss what these uh, special properties are later on. One of the important aspects of our research is to capitalize on the anisotropy of the crystal structure. So just to give you an example of how anisotropy is important, we have one material if you have a crystal material and you push it on one side, you have a bending of the material. If you push it on two different sides, the material will twist, the crystal will twist. And if you push it on the third side, the material will break instantaneously. So anisotropy means that we look at different properties when we look at different directions in the crystal structure. And this is provided by the crystal, the long range order in the crystal. So this is a very, very special property because keep in mind that if we we're looking at different properties, like optical, magnetic, and so forth, we will see different properties in different directions. That is not available with the polymers. So how about mechanical properties? Um, you know, we have tried to categorize them in different categories. So you can see here on the top, those that proceed with relaxation and on the bottom, those that go with mechanical reconfiguration. So we, we can kind of now put all of these mechanical properties into this global map and see where they stand. They're not that many, as you can see from, from here. But what is important when we talk about dynamic processes is the time scale on which they occur. And this is something that we were especially interested in because 
different time scales correspond to different applications. Microfluidics would like very fast applications. Some other, for example, sensing applications would like slower applications, slower processes. You can see here that some processes are inherently very slow. This is a log scale of the x-axis, but some are very, very fast. And we are particularly interested in these fast processes. So in the rest of my presentation, I'm going to kind of very vaguely separate into fast and, and slow processes to kind of lead you to the plethora of different uh, mechanical properties. One of the slowest processes is uh, bending, especially plastic bending. The bending can be plastic as elast and elastic, as you know. And here we have an example of a molecule, very simple hexachlorobenzene, where if you affect the crystal on one side, we have a bending, but if you affect it on the other side, we have breaking. And we kind of very qualitatively correlated this with the anisotropy in the crystal structure, breaking different interactions. In one case, we break and reform halogen-halogen bonds, while in another case, we, we break the pi pi interactions. You can see very clearly different response in the mechanical uh, properties. We were thinking about how can we quantify these, and so uh, it's not always easy for a number of technical reasons that I'm not going to go there, but one of our creative uh, postdoctoral uh, doctoral uh, graduates or students, uh, PhD student, uh, Jad, he found a way to um, fabricate this PDMS filler, pillars, and we shine light on the crystal, the crystal bends the pillar, and based on very simple mechanical engineering, we can find how much force it has been exerted depending on the declination of the pillar. And so now this provides us with the opportunity to put these materials into the bigger space and see where they stand. Sometimes they are not so well performing, but we have examples where they're even outperforming um, polymers and even some softer metallic alloys. So let's look at the process of mechanical deformation. Uh, this is like um, mechanical engineering 101. What happens when you bend the crystal? When you bend the crystal like this, we have first an elastic regime <clears throat> when the crystal can recover its shape after the force has been removed. But if we continue doing that, we go to the plastic regime. And this is the point of no return. It just, it retains the, the current shape. And if we keep pushing it, it uh, gives up at some point and it breaks. This is the fracture point. And so this is, this is uh, the, the relation between this plastic and elastic regime is actually what determines whether the, the material will be plastically or elastically um, in nature. But there we have these some special properties as well called super elasticity and per elasticity, where when we push the crystal, we basically induce a phase transition. And in such a transition, the crystal can sustain a uh, very uh, large strain for a very small stress. And this is not very usual. So this is a so-called super elasticity. If we re remove the load, it will go back to the original shape. And sometimes we have to help it. So sometimes we have to apply force for the other side, and this is called ferroelastic crystal. So these um, properties, which were known for metals and metal alloys are now being discovered and uh, published for organic crystals. And we actually looking at Analogies, which are not always as straightforward, but definitely are new and exciting for this new class of materials. And here is a, another example of the so-called uh, thermomechanical crystal. I would just like to, to bring your attention here to one historical aspect, and this is a, a molecule, which is the hexamethylbenzene, which was actually the molecule used by uh, Kathleen Lonsdale a long time ago when she determined the crystal structure of this molecule and uh, uh, I proved that all the bonds in the benzene are equal and the resonance is really uh, is a real thing. So for X -ray, by, by X-ray diffraction. Um, by the way, Kathleen Lonsen was one of the first um, two women that became a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So there is very interesting historical aspect of this material. Um, we were interested in phase transition of these materials. You can see the crystal changes the shape. It can do work when it does that. And also we, by measuring that, that force, we can actually calculate a number of parameters that we can use to compare the performance of these materials with other materials. So we are taking this to the next stage by benchmarking, by assessing the performance in, within the global materials property space. Uh, some other discoveries that we got on the way is that you can actually control the temperature point, the temperature of the melting of, of, of the material. As you know, the melting point has been used for centuries as one of the most accurate ways to determine the purity of the material as well as phase and other chemical purity. And now we know that 
if you bend the crystal, you introduce so much defects that you can actually alter the melting point. It decreases from 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 Kelvin. It's a small decrease, but it shows that uh, the, even the basic, the, the basic physical properties of the material are affected when you deform it, which is kind of makes sense, but this is a more quantitative way to look at the same, at the same phenomenon. Now, I want to show you also something about topopathological crystals. So there are crystals that form in our body and are not good for our health. And one of the cases is that uh, it's related to the uh, myocardial infraction or um, a heart attack, where it has been postulated back in the 60s that when you have um, uh, a plaque like this, what happens is that in this um, gooey kind of uh, environment, you have crystallization of the cholesterol crystals, which can puncture the, um, the artery, and then you have spill, and then you have a heart attack. And so my student, Maria, again, she managed to crystallize a new form of cholesterol hydrate. And our purpose was to show that indeed, organic crystals being considered very soft are capable of puncturing biological membrane. In this, happen, in this case, it happens to be rabbit heart pericardium, but you can see in principle that organic crystals are not that soft. They can be even dangerous for human health. And so this is just a, a beginning of uh, investigation that could even show that perhaps we can use ways to prevent the formation of cholesterol crystals. There are quite a few uh, people uh, around the world that actually work on this, and we are happy to uh, contribute by our mechanical um, uh, science perspective. A long time ago, about 10 years ago, we started to study also the fast phenomena, which are very important because in this case, we have a release of the mechanical energy on a very fast scale. And these are uh, so-called thermosalient, photosalient, and mechanosalient crystals. They are so fast that actually we have the difficulties to capture them with ordinary cameras, so we have to use high-speed camera for that. And the interesting point here is that they are the fastest probably ways to convert thermal or photo energy into mechanical uh, work. Um, this relates to a biological applications that I don't have that much time to uh, elaborate on them at the moment, but um, Basically, it has to do with, with some biological system like bacteriophages, where they infect uh, the bacteria, they use martensitic transitions. So this is a far analogy of that process where, where we have martensitic phase transition, which is very, very fast. And by using high-speed camera, we actually, uh, sorry, I jumped here, to uh, measure uh, these processes. And you can see here uh, some movies that show how they occur when we excite them, uh, obviously uh, sped up here for uh, for convenience, but what is important is that we measured the phase from progression in these crystals and we found that they are one of the fastest uh, phase transition, if not the fastest phase transition. So this puts us in a very special position to actually use phase transitions to actuate, to, um, to, to move other things around. Um, and also we found that, you know, the phase transition progression front does not always correlate to the expansion of the crystal. There is a, some lagging there. And that, it, uh, that comes from the fact that some of that kinetic energy dissipates or elastic energy dissipates before it's converted to kinetic energy to perform uh, mechanical work. So I can uh, answer more questions in relation to this um, in the, uh, the follow-up session. One way that we wanted to characterize these crystals is to measure the uh, force that they exert. And for this, we use very sensitive uh, sensors that we put on top of the crystal, the crystal expands and we can measure the force. From there, you can calculate a bunch of other properties. And then we can put these in material science diet uh, plots like this. And we can find out that, for example, this material is better in terms of strain than many of the other materials and also better in terms of the volumetric power density, but it's not as good as some, some others. But keep in mind, what is important is we are here working with the simple homogeneous crystals. Or unlike these other devices here, which are complex devices based on motors and you know, different components. So this is the, the, the beauty of this work is that basically we work with the very, very simple systems. This is another example which has been discovered a long time ago, but we had the chance now to uh, correlate it or to compare it with other systems. And we found that it expands about 50% of its original site. And as you can see here from this plot, it's actually number two in uh, the, the, the store, the expansion percent of all the crystals reported out there. 
it has uh, it is a uh, second only to one of the uh, materials but i have to mention that this material here this integrates upon expansion our materials does not at least pretend cycles of expansion and contraction now one of the most interesting developments is the so-called shape memory for you uh, for some of you that are not familiar with this term shape memory is such property that is discovered uh, back in the 70s um, uh, last uh, last century for materials uh, uh, specifically metal alloys and of also of course also for polymers where you basically mechanically deform the material and then you change the temperature and when that happens the material recovers its original shape so it kind of memorizes the shape and we were thinking, can we do something like this? Because this is a pure phase transition, as you can see here from the plot below the, from the movie. Can we do something like this for crystals? Yes, the answer is uh, we can. And in 2016, we, uh, we uh, uh, published the first uh, shape memory organic crystal. So what is happening here is when you push the crystal, you actually induce a phase transition in only part of it but the other one remains uh, as it is. And we have evidence for this because we used a singleton X-ray diffraction uh, to a microfocus X-ray diffraction to determine the structure of the two parts and we see two different phases. So basically we have one form in one half and the other form in other half. And then when we heat the compound, the second form goes back to the first form. And so we have this effect of mechanical uh, memory, which is in some far analogy, similar to what we observe in uh, metals and metal alloys. Now, I would like to tell you something about applications because there's always this discussion, what can we do with them? So, of course, we are chemists or engineers, but we can only uh, have a kind of um, demonstration of what we can do with these materials. And one of them is to use them as solid fuses. So the crystals break, our crystals break sometimes. So we use a simple tolerance reaction to cover a crystal with silver. And then we use this in a circuit, a circuit where we warm by conducting electricity. Once the crystal undergoes phase transition, it breaks and then it disrupts the, uh, the flow of electricity. And so this is a so-called solid to solid fuses, which kind of overcomes the so-called RC problem that is uh, encountered with the metals or metal alloys, where we have partial evaporation there. So in, keep in mind in common fuses, we have melting and melting can uh, lead to partial evaporation and that can uh, establish a short circuit. In our case, we only have solid to solid transition. So there is no evaporation and this overcomes the arson problem. Another very active area of research that many groups around the world are, has, have taken now, including in India, it's very active and China, uh, is the using the crystals as optical waveguides. So I have to mention our collaboration here with Professor uh, Rajatrai Chandra Sekar from University of Hyderabad. We work very close together. The idea here is, and also with Jilin University in China, this is Professor Hong Yu Zhang. So our idea here is to replace, uh, at least on a micro scale, the optical waveguides that now use uh, silicon, uh, uh, silica, so silicon dioxide, uh, or sometimes uh, um, uh, doped with germanium. And as you know, all the information that you are looking at the screen comes from my country, from Macedonia, where I am now, through these optical fibers. And uh, the idea is to look for new, uh, um, new uh, materials because the optical fibers are robust. Um, they are made on, made on, uh, made from uh, inorganic materials but they're not chem chemically versatile. We don't have much chances to, to play with their composition. So what if we replace this with organic crystals? This is one of the um, uh, uh, examples that I, I showed you before. We can, we can use the crystal to, uh, as an optical waveguide. So I'm going to skip this slide, but perhaps this example is more important because now we have uh, photochemically responsive crystals. So it can react, it can bend under UV light and one side and collect it to the other side. So what this enables us is to use the UV light to control the shape of the crystal and in fact to control the path of the light that passes through the crystal. So by using uh, this kind of two-dimensional fluorescence map we can actually see that we can control, we can have a spatial control over the, over the uh, output, light output from the crystal by using two types of light, one passing through and one passing uh, um, perpendicular to the crystal to control the crystal shape. There is a lot of development in this field. 
one of the developments is uh, uh, we are trying to find ways to scale them down. So basically to make a micro optical circuits. And for this, our uh, collaborator, uh, Professor Chandra Sekar has devised the uh, uh, AFM uh, tip. So basically we use AFM atomic force microscopy to manipulate the crystals, to slice them, uh, to uh, cut them and so forth. And to make an actual optical circuit or the microscopic level by using uh, organic crystals. And so there's a lot of developments in this in this uh, area as well. But uh, I have to remind you here that the signal that we receive over internet or internet or wave uh, um, wave guides they don't come in the visible part of the spectrum. Actually, they come in the near infrared part of the spectrum. As you can see here from the spectrum, we have these different bands and all the information comes in this part of the spectrum. So we asked ourselves, can we make this uh, also, can we replicate this with organic crystals? Yes, we have to have a very small molecule which has a very strong transmission in that part of the spectrum. And indeed, this is a simple um, amino acid where we can actually use the crystal of, of this amino acid to transfer uh, near infrared uh, pulses or signals and then collect it from the other side. So this is the first demonstration that we can use organic crystals as optical transducers in the telecommunication uh, regime. Um, now, a little bit of uh, change of the gears here. Uh, we also were interested uh, whether we can elicit other properties that are common for polymers, such as self-healing. You know, self-healing is a process where you break um, uh, material, uh, you put the two pieces together, and then you wait for some time for the chemistry to work its, its magic. And finally, you can uh, see that the two pieces have come together and that the, the uh, object has healed. And indeed, in 2016, we tried to find a dynamic covalent chemistry and we decided to go with the disulfide bonds because they are very common and uh, most perhaps commonly used dynamic covalent bonds where basically we use dynamic covalent chemistry to self-heal the crystal by putting the two pieces together. And of course, there have to be structural prerequisites for this to happen, but it works. Unfortunately, it works to a very small extent, five to 6% of efficiency in the healing. Uh, nevertheless, we have uh, visual and also uh, analytical evidence that the self-healing has occurred. So you can play with the crystals, move it around um, to turn it upside down and even use computer tomography, as you can see from the right side here, to look inside the crystal to see the difference in the density and actually see the connecting points between the two pieces. So this is a, our uh, a recent developments where we use a nano uh, CT or micro CT to look in the interior of the material and I see where the connection points and how efficiently it has self-healed. As I mentioned, this was only five to 6% healing. It was encouraging, but very, very low. So a lot of uh, 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 eyebrows raised, you know, people were asking, is it true or not? Yes, it is two years later, we uh, stepped up and actually uh, improved this for an order of magnitude. So this is a completely different chemistry. It's a boronate uh, metathesis uh, between uh, uh, resorcinol and boronic acid. And now we have healing between 67% in the first round going down to 44% in the fifth round. So of course there is some decrease in efficiency due to imperfect um, uh, coupling between the two parts or you know, debris falling between the crystals and so forth. But in principle, this works. So this was taken by other groups and they published very nice papers by using different chemistry to demonstrate uh, self healing. One of our targets was to show that this happens in hybrid perovskites. You know, perovskites are one of the most important um, uh, most important materials uh, the, at the present, and this is why we try to um, to try to to do the same with perovskites. So I see the um, screen um, with Kunal on it, but I don't see my presentation anymore. Something has happened. I think my presentation has closed. Can I go back and um, reopen it? Yes, it's good. Ah, okay. Um, I have only a small. Um, part remaining, so I hope we can. Um, uh, can you see my screen? Um, not yet. Not yet, I have to probably reshare, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened, just suddenly it was, um, it just uh, was logged off. Can you see it now? Yes, it's loading now. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, yeah. Now let me go to the slide. Okay, so uh, you can see the, the slide now, 41. We can. 
Okay, okay. So we are interested whether we can apply this concept to self-healing perovskites, because as you know, perovskites are one of the most important materials of the, uh, of, uh, at the moment for solar cell applications and other applications. <clears throat> and indeed, uh, perovskites can heal. There is evidence published in this paper, but also you can see that we can achieve between 26 and 59% of self-healing in perovskite single crystals. And of course, we have again the CT scan to confirm that, but also plenty of other mechanical tests uh, to prove that. And so I would like to advise you to uh, check this um, article and see, you know, uh, I think it's very important for those who are interested in the perovskite chemistry. Um, other applications is optical waveguides. You know, we can put crystals within hollow crystals to expand the uh, uh, emission window between the green and red light. And even we can self uh, heal or weld these crystals by epitaxial growth of the two parts of the crystal coming uh, together as it's shown here in this, in this example. Unfortunately, I don't want to take too much of your time with uh, different examples. I just want to show you several uh, applications of very different devices where we can use organic crystals. We are kind of exploring different um, electrical devices. So I mentioned optical waveguides. This is another example of transduction of um, uh, signals in a telecom regime, but we can also make a back, a back gate phototransistors when we shine light and we increase the, uh, the con conductivity of the, of the crystal. Some of my colleagues are, have taken this to the next level and exploring different properties, especially how can we improve or change this conductivity when we deform the crystal. So it's a whole new direction developing there. This is another case of a microelectromechanical device or MEMS device, where we have a crystal deposit on cantilevers and these oscillate at certain frequency. So when we uh, hit this device, we can take the uh, thermocellian crystal over a phase transition. And what happens is we change the frequency of oscillation. So in principle, we control the frequency at which this device is operating. And this can have implication on the performance of the device. As you can see clearly, we have different frequencies for different uh, temperatures. Um, one other example that I had to mention here is the so-called flow sensors or hair sensors. These are uh, sensors where we have basically a single crystal which has been stamped with a fluorescence dye on top of it. We pass light through it and we, we measure the fluorescence that comes back from the crystal. So we have light through the crystal here and then it shines the light back from the fluorescence material and we, we record that here. And so what happens when, the, when, we sh when we put a flow of air, nitrogen or any gas, this crystal is deformed and we have a change in the um, intensity of the light that we receive back. So we can make a calibration curve and use this system to measure the flow of the air. These flow sensors uh, or hair sensors that are bio-inspired from some animals, they're increasingly being important for fly-by field systems in uh, aeronautics and other applications. But if for the first time, we show that you, can, you don't have to use a polymer for that or a metal, you can use organic crystals for the same purpose. So our other exploration uh, directions are to diversify the um, number of stimuli that we can use to affect the crystal. So we have explored the layer by layer application uh, approach where we uh, deposit polymers on surface of crystals to control their shape by humidity, magnetic fields in water and other liquid environments, which can be important for underwater applications. We can use low temperature to uh, make soft robots that can uh, grip uh, objects, can release load and can transfer load from one place to another. But also we can use the strong dependence on the fluorescence of some of these crystals to measure the temperature. So we can monitor how does fluorescence change and use that change to measure temperature in the crystal environment. And so you can see all of these materials here are hybrid materials. We combine crystals with a layer of polymers and that expands the applicability of these materials because now the crystal is the support and the polymer is the one that we use as a glue to attach a lot of things. We just have a paper now when we combine the crystals with maxines, also a very popular material nowadays, and we explore the phototermal effects by using maxines as a, as a photoreceptors to convert them into uh, thermal uh, energy. I would just like to, for the end of my presentation, because we are about the uh, time that I have available, to show you some of the smart organic crystals that are um, kind of a more of a, uh, inspirational, uh, visually appealing. So this is the crystal, believe it or not, which behaves as a, as, a, as a plant tendril. 
and it responds to the change in the humidity gradient that we induce when we approach it with uh, with a with a glove. So you can see that, that you know it's it's very difficult to uh, understand or to perceive uh, uh, inanimate uh, uh, um, dead basically material that responds like a life material because it has this functionality to respond to humidity. Um, and keep in mind, it doesn't require light, it doesn't require temperature, it just change, changes to the, to the humidity. And this is very important for humidity sensors, but especially in regions where I'm located in Abu Dhabi, in the UA, where this very arid region. So we need materials which can be used as um, hydro sensors or humidity sensors and should not be uh, exposed to other types of stimuli. Another example of crystal that can walk along the surface, what we do again, we change the humidity in surrounding and because of that, it changes the shape. So it progresses uh, uh, spatially uh, through, through a space, which is again, something we, we, can, we have seen with polymers before in, and with biological systems, but now we can have this uh, with, with crystals. And this is another device. It's kind of a primitive spider that we put a load on top of it. And you, as you can see, where it's increased the humidity, it kind of, it, it kind of uh, struggles to, 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 to lift the load but at some point we remove the humidity and, and it gives up. So we can control and, and use these as a soft robotics in principle or soft materials, smart materials that can perform some sort of a work. What are the futures of these fields? If there are many and plenty, and I think there is a lot of space for everyone to, uh, to join. Uh, we can think about modeling these systems. We have done some work on that. We can think that using the computation, the power of computational chemistry to to be able to understand what is happening at the molecular scale. Uh, obviously, we have to synthesize new materials, and this is the most active field where people are just reporting new materials almost every week. Uh, new methods, I showed you some CT scan. I didn't show you some other exotic uh, ways that we, we, that we look at to, uh, to look at these materials and, uh, and what they can do, but there is a lot of room here as well. Uh, crystal engineering is very important because it could help us understand the connection between the intermolecular interactions and the mechanical properties or uh, mechanical performance. And finally, we have to also each time demonstrate applications because this is what the funding agencies will, are looking for. They are looking for applications in every uh, material that we develop. So just to summarize, um, I hope that I showed you that uh, we, we are looking at a, at a new class of materials which has a special properties because it combines two unique, very important properties, long range order and anisotropy. And that makes them very special. As a separate class, what we need to work on is as, as chemists, as engineers, is to bring this to the attention to the others, to, uh, uh, to put these materials out there and tell them that you have a new materials class and there are so many things that you can do with that. You, know, you can actually solve some of the, uh, the deficits or some of the pitfalls of the other materials by using this new material class. Their main assets are that, that they are light in weight. Keep in mind, they're always made of light atoms, so that translates into low density. They are soft, and the softness does not always have to be bad. In fact, all the polymers are soft, and we know how many applications the polymer and how important role they, they play in our lives. So they are soft and ordered. And what we need to do is understand the intermolecular interactions and how do they translate into these mechanical properties. And of course, that is only possible if we are able to establish structure property correlations. And I think our uh, chair today, Professor Thomas, has done a lot of work recently in that regard. And we look forward, we're very excited to see what happens ne next. We hope that for groups like his, him, his group and others can help us understand what is happening at a molecular level. And finally, how can we design possibly these mechanical properties. At the end, I would like to show you about my group. This is a very fresh uh, picture from uh, about one month ago. We are present in social media. Please do follow us for more recent developments. These are the current members, uh, some of the alumni. There are many more here that are, uh, there's no space actually to put them on the slide, but I thank them for the active contribution. I had a very, very, very dynamic group that are of, uh, enthusiastic people that are in, in, excited about what they do. Our many collaborators, again, only um, uh, uh, um, some of them are shown here. And of course, uh, our sponsors. Uh, and of course, I would like to uh, thank you for your kind attention uh, for this very, very fast uh, fast talk. And I would like to uh, be able to answer your questions. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Professor Panchin. Uh, that was a wonderful lecture. And I think you might be able to see a lot of floating reactions coming in. Just 
the audience acknowledging the lecture. Uh, so I, we have a lot of questions coming in. So we will quickly move into that. So Aparna, please quickly launch the audience poll. And in the meantime, Professor Thomas can get ready to shoot the questions from the audience. So we have a live audience poll. We have three questions. We want to know what has brought you to the session of ACS Science Talks. And are you attending ACS Science Talks for the first time? And how did you hear about this ACS Science Talks session? So we'll keep the poll open for another 30 seconds. And then we'll start the Q&A session. So I'm starting a timer on my end. So please quickly start answering. So we have another uh, 10 seconds left on the poll and I'll be counting down now. <clears throat> Uh, five, four, three, two, and one. Aparna, please go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So thank you so much, everyone, for answering the poll. And we can see a lot of people joining us out of scientific curiosity and a great number of people who have joined us who have this topic as their active area of research or related to the area of research. We have a good distribution of around 47% joining us for the first time. So welcome everyone. I hope you have enjoyed the science talks till now and we look forward to seeing you in other science talks and people who have joined us again. We are glad to have you back. And well, uh, as always, this has been the case. We'll keep on sending you more emails. <laughs> with that, I'll be out of the way and over to you, Professor Thomas. And Professor Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pinal Gupta. Uh, and thank you very much, Professor Panche Namo, uh, for this very ins insightful uh, talk. And it was truly inspiring, uh, especially uh, for a group like us and for the students. It was, it was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the questions. Probably we should start from uh, some simple questions uh, to more specific ones. So uh, here is a question, how big do these organic crystals need to be in order to be subjected to mechanical property analysis? So mm -hmm. that's very I... interesting. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, in order for them to exhibit the mechanical properties, there is no actual limitation in size, at least on the upper, upper, upper uh, side. Um, but on the lower side, you, we need to have a sufficient number of unit cells in the structure for a, a sufficient um, mechanical strain to accumulate inside the crystal as so as to be expressed in a particular way. And I'm talking about the fast processes. So keep in mind that we have a kind of um, interplay between the time it takes to uh, get the mechanical response and the time it takes for the energy, uh, elastic energy to be accumulated in the crystal. And these two will determine the outcome. And so that actually translates into different um, shapes or sorry, different sizes of the crystals showing different response. Sometimes you can see the response in a larger crystals, but you don't see it in a smaller crystals for that very same purpose. Other uh, um, factors such as crystal quality, defects and so forth, history, previous history of the sample all play a role. So there is, there's a lot of, uh, of these factors that need to be accounted for. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, uh, very interesting work on the crystallization of cholesterol molecules. Uh, have you looked into the into other crystallization dynamics related to ailments such as gout caused by accumulation of uric acid crystals? So uh, if I can add to this question, um, it's the hardness of these crystals. It's just the rose, right? That was, that was the villain here. So what what is what is that uh, uh, coming from this area? What is that we can contribute or you you are uh, projecting to uh, contribute to that that problem? But that's a great uh, question, also a great idea. Um, so as you know, um, uh, mechanical properties are very important. But the way the, the reason why we actually focused on the cholesterol crystals is because of the heart attack, you know, and, uh, and the you know obviously the importance of this disease. I think the question comes from an expert in the field because I can see that the person is probably familiar with other pathological crystals. There are several groups around the world that actually work intensely on uric acid, uric acid hydrate and others. And obviously 
in all cases, uh, there's the in interaction between the crystal and the, and the membrane or, or and the tissue. The tissue being much softer than the crystal, except for bones, obviously, is, uh, uh, is where this interaction really matters. So I think that this is just the beginning, and I would, in, this, I, I, would, I would say this is an invitation for more of the groups to look at this interaction between the crystals and the cells. There are groups that are actively working on the field, but the dependence between the uh, mechanical integrity of the tissue and their relation with the uh, stiffness in particular direction in the crystal. I also have that the sharpness of the crystal has, has to play a role as well as the hydration state of the membrane. Keep in mind that in living systems, we always have, have a hydrate state. So all of these things need to be considered, but I see that as a, as a really nice field for, for future work, where interaction with the crystal and, and biological tissues on various levels. Thank you, it's nice. So just to, oh, an add-on question. So are, were you opening up a new subfield within this by that work, or uh, do you have a, a uh, any idea about is there any existing uh, you know stream of research going in within this direction or is it a beginning of uh, that kind of studies uh, so yes our, our purpose was to to see uh, how much force is exerted by the crystal and from different direction and which are the the face facets the faces of the crystal that are most uh, likely to uh, to uh, perform the penetration but of course other other groups for example there's a couple of, of uh, research groups in the Weizmann Institute in Israel. They're working from a different perspective from uh, identifying the, the correlation between the, the, the mechanical properties and the different phases, not going perhaps necessarily to the older way to the to measuring the force that is required to, uh, to interact with the membrane. So definitely there is a lot of space for, for research. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, uh, Professor Khanna Sureshan, uh, uh, somebody who has uh, made significant contribution to this field. Uh, so the question is, the use of dynamic covalent chemistry to design self-healing crystals is brilliant. Is it possible to fuse two or more crystals exploiting this dynamic covalent chemistry? Maybe mm -hmm. after grinding the surfaces and joining them? That's a question, yeah. Yes, um, that is always an excellent question coming from an uh, established expert in the field, <laughs> as you know. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sureshan, for that. We are working on that at the moment, and we have some initial results. Different employing different covalent chemistry is not very easy because we actually made a library of dynamic covalent bonds, and we had to eliminate most of them except for two or three for a number of reasons. Uh, the reasons being um, some of them are um, uh, condensation reactions, some of them require a third molecule, uh, some of them are not fully reversible, and some of them are not easy to realize in crystals. So we did systematic search on the covalent bonds and our first choice was disulfide and the second choice was the, the metathesis in boronates. But we do have a couple of other examples that, that we would like to investigate further. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, um, I have, uh, again, once again, a small follow-up question regarding this, probably a naive question. Uh, uh, when we cut a crystal, a molecular crystal, uh, the simple assumption would be that uh, we are not cutting the uh, molecules. We are, we are just separating them and we are probably cutting apart the intermolecular interactions. Mm -hmm. Is this the case in the, it, it can't be the case when it comes to disulfides, right? It can be the case, but we do have a EPR evidence and that is also described in the paper that radicals are created. In fact, we can assign the radicals and see exactly what kind of, uh, what kind of radicals are created. So that is the, that is the, one of the, I think, lucky cases because when you break the disulfides, you have the unpaired electrons and you can monitor that reaction by EPR. In fact, you can use a spatial result EPR to see throughout the crystal and through the surface and see where most of the radicals are present. That's not the case with other uh, chemistry like the boronates where there is no formation of radicals. So we do have evidence uh, for that. Thank you, that's excellent. Uh, very fundamental. Uh, uh, now, one more question. Regarding the self-healing crystals, the amazing development from 5% efficiency to 70 plus percent efficiency was a type of uh, was the type of healing interact uh, interaction the main aspect because in the former it seemed like non non covalent interaction while in the latter it was covalent bonding It's quite similar to the question the add-on question I asked uh, but uh, you have any comment? 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically, what we need to, to find is a, a spatial result met, met, uh, method to look at the surface an interface, and that's not 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 always easy. But we found a round way to look at that, and that is uh, the way to distinguish between adhesion and cohesion. Um, and the way to do that is, in our case, <clears throat> we, we capitalize on the different dynamics of this self-healing. So these two aspects, these two processes work, operate in a different way over time. And so if you have in contact the same pieces <clears throat> for a small amount of time and large amount of time, the effects are very different. So you can actually dis disentangle the two effects by changing the time of contact. Of course, considering that all the other possible effects are removed, such as adsorption of water on the, on the surface, and that has to be done in, uh, obviously, in uh, 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 low humidity or uh, in an uh, um, uh, atmosphere without uh, water. Uh, and also, if all of these are, uh, all of these are uh, preserved, all of these conditions are fulfilled, then, of course, you, you can investigate that. You can also play with, um, with a force that keep, keeps the things, uh, the two pieces together. And you can find that in our uh, perovskite paper, when we use different force, and then we see the change or the dependence on the force on the healing. So clearly we have a threshold above which the healing occurs and below that it doesn't occur. So there's a lot of factors you can change to, to make sure that it's really a reformation of, of covalent bonds. IR spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy are all something that, that you know, is, can, usually, uh, can usually also use for the same purpose. Thank you. The next question, for light induced changes in this crystal, is mm -hmm. the change reversible? That is, if we turn off the light, do they go back to the initial phases? If yes, what is it? What is the time scale to reverse back? Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> this is also a good question. I'm not sure on which about which property does the person refer to, uh, but probably it's about the bending. So, so we have fast processes like jumping, and we have a slow processes like bending. Generally, if you remember one of the slides that I showed, and I can show it again, um, uh, and that is in this perspective uh, paper in Jackson 2020, I can, I can also send the paper. Um, the bending processes are usually very slow. They occur on a second time scale. In fact, we found that, that they are very, very slow and too slow for some applications like microfluidics. The reason for that is, uh, actually there are several reasons. The first one is that when we use a photochemical reaction, we change only a very small part of the crystal, only the surface, to create a bilayer when we have interfacial strain and that creates bending moment. Uh, but the second is that there is a very inefficient translation of that bending moment throughout the structure to elicit mechanical response. So by, de by default, the bending processes are very slow unless they are thermo thermally induced, unless we have the the photothermal effect. The photothermal effect comes with very fast deformation, sometimes on a microsecond scale, but it comes at the cost of a very small deformations. So there, the deformation can be only up to one or at most several degrees. And for some applications, for example, mimicking cilia or biological, uh, biological system that may be important, but for microfluidics, that kind of deformation is just simply not sufficient to uh, change the flow of, uh, of a liquid, for example. So it's a, it's a trade-off. So uh, just to, I'm, I'm, as we get kind of extended session, I'm really glad that uh, we can, I'm sure we can continue and there's like more than 30 questions still with the audience. <laughs> so I don't think so we'll be able to cover all of them, but I'm, so I'll leave it to you, Professor Thomas and Professor Panche, maybe two more questions and then we can close the session. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see such a response to my interest. I yes, a lot of, lot of questions. So, uh, uh, Okay, since there are a lot of questions and I don't have the time to pick from them, uh, I'll <laughs> take a selfish route of asking one of my questions. So you, <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, this uh, hybrid perovskites uh, sh showing self-healing, right? So were there uh, 2D hybrid perovskites or, uh, or three-dimensional hybrid perovskites? This is, this is three-dimensional bulk crystals. Yeah, there is a, a work done by David Kine when, when they actually show self-healing in uh, polycrystalline films sometimes accelerated by light, and they do, do, do this by using the diffusion, uh, light diffusion um, uh, process. But in our case, it's just two bulk crystals, nothing more than that. And uh, the possible mechanism could be similar to the one reported by Reddy, the piezo, the polarity at the boundaries. Is that the possible? It is, 
it is, it is a diffusion process. And we have this actually evidenced by using the Rama spectroscopy and as the surface scanning, scanning by, by Rama spectroscopy. So we, we can see the, the, the surface in, inside. Yeah. Okay, uh, then I'll, oh, the, I'll take one question, one more last question. What kind of phase transition is happening in the shape memory crystal? And is there any contribution of local pressure that is helping in shape recovery? Is there uh, any contribution yes. of local pressure in shape recovery? Yes, this is a very important question actually. So uh, in that particular case, which is the first case that we reported, uh, we have a phase transition where we have terephthalic acid, which uh, uh, tends to pack in uh, layers of actually tapes and these tapes slide atop of each other. So we have a change in the interplanar distance or center, centroid to centroid distance between the two molecules. And that can happen in both ways. And it can happen by using mechanical pressure. And so the mechanical pressure is used only in one way of the process to uh, induce the formation of the second phase and to contribute to the formation of the bilayer. But the temperature is used as a second stimulus to push it back. And so we have two stimuli, and this is why we can switch between the two different um, states by using uh, by using the, uh, uh, the this, uh, this this crystal. But of course, the, the material memorizes that change, and of course, it goes back by uh, when when we go to, uh, to the other state. So this is possible due to this um, the mem memorization or uh, history of the sample that that remains in the crystal structure. Okay. This would be the okay. most, most qualitative explanation, but of course we can discuss in more details so fine. Okay, so thank you once again for uh, yeah for this wonderful talk and uh, over to you, Dr. Kunal Gupta. Thank okay. you, Professor Thomas, and thank you, Professor Panche. Uh, wonderful to see the response, and I'll I'll basically want Professor Panche if you want to kind of close the session with a brief remark for our audience because you can still see there are close to two hundred audience still live sitting with us. Uh, well, I, I would like to, to um, give a round of thanks at this uh, point, you know, thanks for the ACS for enabling this dissemination of information and knowledge, you know, going over the barriers, geographical barriers, and, you know, in times of reduced research funding, this is extremely important, obviously, uh, and the science should not have borders, obviously. And I'm happy that uh, if this uh, uh, evolves into development of new collaboration, we already had some discussion before this meeting, and I can see already uh, ACS uh, keeping connecting us, you know, uh, between the countries, between the region, and, and and internationally. So, and also thank you, thanks for for the audience, thanks for to the organizers. I would also like to, let's say, informally invite you to visit us in Abu Dhabi. It's uh, very close to India for one thing, but it's also connecting the world. We are basically connecting Asia and Europe. And so we are becoming a kind of a hub, not only for science, but also for knowledge-based economy, hopefully in the future. That is our goal. Wonderful. Um, so I guess I'll close the session now. So this brings us to the end of today's session. We hope that you've enjoyed this broadcast. We invite you to view the edited recordings from the past events in the ACS Science Talks Library. At the end of the session, you will receive a brief survey Kindly share your feedback with us so that we can continue to improve and serve you better. On behalf of all of us at ACS, thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon for more ACS events. Until then, stay safe and healthy. Thanks again.